from the Thai Cats Audio Network. This is Speaking with the Enemy. Yes, it is Speaking with the Enemy and the Enemy this week, the Edmonton Elks. And the man who has the uh, the color descriptions on 630 Chad in Edmonton is Dave Campbell, and he's with us now. And uh, Dave, it is safe to say that this is not the way the Elks saw their season going. Wow. You know, it shows you preseason predictions aren't worth the uh, – the, the, the characters on Twitter or the paper they're printed on, uh, neither are rosters on paper. And I think we all looked at this Elks team on paper and, and felt, man, they, they could be a threat in the West. They could be one of those dark horse teams or, or, or a wild card team that could finish anywhere from fourth to, to first. Uh, I had them finishing second. I thought the talent level was enough to, to overcome a rookie head coach in Jamie Elizondo. And uh, wow, it's just been a complete 180. It's been, it's been shocking, really, just to to see how difficult it's been for the Elks. Um, and it really started from week one. They should have beat the Red Blacks. They were the better team, especially defensively. But you know, they let that one get away, and and that's been kind of the theme of the season in, in some respects. And in other respects, it's just been. You know, the, the COVID outbreak didn't help. And there's, you know, there's a lot of noise around the club. And But when you have a losing season, you're going to get that. So, unfortunately, they haven't been able to overcome it. And uh, that's why their playoff hopes are, are hanging by a literal, literal thread right now. And it's and your point, because uh, you really can't pinpoint a specific – part of the season that that that's really been the catalyst for everything I mean because you know even though Trevor Harris struggled there was still signs like that Labor Day game when he puts up 400 yards I mean there were still signs that he was the quarterback they thought they were getting you know a year and a mm-hmm. half ago so I mean what 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 do you attribute the kind of chaos of the season everything kind of all COVID outbreaks really I mean it, it, there, it's been a chaotic season to call it to put it lightly yeah um, but there I really think... is no catalyst to it I think like, yeah I, I I don't think there's one thing, and, and usually in sports, you, you can't point to one thing. Uh, a lot of it does start at the quarterback position on offense, and Trevor Harris in four or six games, he didn't play very well. And in two games, he played spectacular. The, the game in BC, when they won their first game uh, on August 19th, he you know didn't score. I think they scored one touchdown, but they moved the ball very well. And then four touchdown passes on Labor Day against the Calgary Stampeders, and that was his best performance and the offense's best performance. But I, I think – let's just start there. The offense is underachieved big time. We all expected more from Darrell Walker and Greg Ellingson. Hasn't happened. James Wilder Jr. is their runaway candidate for most outstanding player. For, for the most part, he's been very good. But you look at their offensive line. How many tackles retired before the season? You know, they had Derek Dennis, then they had uh, Tommy Drehine, and they had Randy Richards, and, and then Colin Kelly, their starting right tackle for the last few years, rips his peck while doing push-ups during quarantine. They've had five rookies, Louis, start on the O-line. That, that's too many. That's way too many. So, and then you look at the special teams, and it's been awful. Like, th- this is probably the worst return game I have seen in my years covering this team. And I know they've struggled. You know, the line is they've struggled ever since Giz, you know, Henry the Gizmo Williams retired, and that's kind of true. Um, but their special teams return in, in the return game has been awful. Defensively, it's been their best phase. And I think this is the, the lifeblood of the team, the emotion. But really, you know, complementary football is very important in this sport where you have all three phases in balance. They, they haven't had that this year. It's been – and every phase, and I think the defense has, has taken less of this heat, but I think every phase at one point has really let them down. And it's offense and especially special teams have been the, the two culprits in this, uh, in this awful season. Yeah, and the Ticats all this week have been talking about that D-line of the Elks and having to be ready for it uh, heading into Friday's game. Uh, let's go back to, to Trevor Harris because, I mean, for the first time since 2015, Trevor Harris and Greg Ellingson aren't playing on the same team together. How did Ellingson kind of react to the news of Trevor being traded and just kind of the general the general ro- mood around the team when, when a guy who's brought in to be the franchise quarterback uh, is, is traded midseason? Yeah, you know, for I talked to Greg Ellingson on Sunday during their day A, and you could tell the personal side of things 
Uh, it, it hurts because he is very close with Trevor Harris. They played together since 2016, as, as, as you mentioned. Um, but, you know, he's going to be professional and say the, the right things. And he said, look, I'm, I'm part of this team. I'm going to let the management do their thing. I'm going to, you know, my job is to go out and, and be a receiver and make plays for my offense. Uh, he's fully supporting Taylor Cornelius. And uh, I think that's the right attitude. And, you know, there are some players on that team that are very close with Trevor Harris, so it's very hard. So, you know what? I think Friday is a real test of that. How do you move on from that? And then, of course, since then, they have a new quarterback in who we, we're not sure when we're going to see him on the field, but Nick Arbuckle was uh, traded to the Elks this week. So maybe that kind of, you know, elevates everyone's spirit right now. But, you know, I, I think um, – I think there's going to be, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of veterans on this team and they're going to be like, well, you know, it's tough to see your quarterback go, but that's part of the business. And when you're, when you're in this position at two and seven, I guess all bets are off as far as who's available and who's not. I guess I'm just surprised how, you know, with Trevor Harris being traded, how, how we got to this point, especially with his relationship with Jamie Elizondo, it just didn't seem like those two, meshed very well this year for whatever reason and you know Brock Sunderland the GM just you know you know he could read that and it's time to get rid of him you know unfortunately yeah and and I mean the Ellingson the Darrell Walker the 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 pieces they surrounded him with like you said I I mean I'm sure it's just just confusion being like why didn't this work it should have worked why didn't it (laughs) yeah and that's going to be a huge question mark that I think a lot of people, including myself, are going to ponder for a long, long time, and especially, you know, leading up to 2022 training camp when we can start flushing 2021, thankfully. (laughs) So it's, it's a mystery because I, I, I don't think they should have been this bad, but you know, I kind of go back, it starts up front. And when you have all those, all those, uh, you know, fresh faces on the offensive line and sometimes it works out for you and sometimes it doesn't, and it really hasn't worked out. Um, and we've seen that, you know, the teams that have struggled this year, Ottawa as well, like they, they have a very young offensive line and it, it, it's a completely different game. And especially if you're plugging Americans on there or young Canadians, like it, it is completely different to jump from like NCAA or, you know, NFL camps to, to the CFL. So definitely, uh, understanding the O-line issues for sure. Um, let's talk about Taylor Cornelius because I mean, this, he's hard to miss on the field at, uh, you know, six, five, two thirty five, whatever he is. But uh, it, are the Elks, are you convinced that the Elks believe that this is their guy for the future? Like, is that what the next five games for the Elks are is deciding whether or not Cornelius is, is the real deal or the right guy in, in Edmonton? Yeah, I think I, I do agree with that. Uh, I do think this is a, an audition for the next five games for Taylor Cornelius. Um, and what, what have we seen out of him? You know, I thought the first start against the Bombers on September 18th was, uh, I thought it was impressive because he only had one full day of practice with the first team offense. Cause Trevor Harris, who had the neck head issues, uh, he actually was cleared to practice and then all the way through the end of day two, got pulled. And then that thrust the, the young man into, uh, in, into the fire. I thought he did okay. And then in Ottawa, I thought it was a bit of a step back. He did get the ball downfield, and you can see his movement in the pocket. And then the uh, coming off the bench in Winnipeg, I thought he gave them a little bit of a spark and a terrible performance uh, by everyone in that game, except for the defense. And then I thought the best thing about the last game uh, here in Edmonton against the Bombers on October 15th, the best thing he did is he didn't turn the ball over. Had a couple of close calls, didn't turn the ball over. But one thing I like about him is his movement in the pocket. and you don't have to be a running quarterback in this league, but you have to be a quarterback that can, that can move. And he gets himself out of trouble uh, quite often and changes some angles and throwing lanes for him. So, um, you, you know, even with the Nick Arbuckle trade, Jamie Elizondo says, you know, Taylor Cornelius right now is our starter. Dakota Krukop is our backup. And we'll see where Nick Arbuckle fits in. So uh, I think this is a real uh, big opportunity for Taylor Cornelius to see how he handles this. You know, first, you know, Trevor Harris is gone, so he doesn't have a veteran other than Prukop, you know, kind of looking over his shoulder, or maybe that's the wrong term, but, you know, the quarterback room's a little thin with experience, and then they bring in Arbuckle, and now that kind of changes the game a little bit because you might have the next starting quarterback of the Elks, but if you're Taylor Cornelius, I want to keep this spot. So, yeah, the next five games will be very, very interesting, especially that three and seven stretch. 
uh, to end the season, which is uh, absolutely going to be insane. But, uh, yeah, this is a big opportunity, and I'm really curious to see how Cornelius handles this. And, uh, you know, the one thing I loved, and I was reading your, uh, your kind of tee up for the week on, uh, on the global news there, that uh, it's, it's that Jamie Elizondo knows exactly what it takes to get into the playoffs. He's not, he's yeah. not playing for next season. Like he, he was very specific in terms of what needs to happen to yeah. get into the playoffs. And I think if you're on that team, it's nice to know that, you know, obviously the coach is going to say we're playing for this year. We're not mathematically eliminated yet. And I go back to when the Ticats started that year 0-8, June, June. Jones came in and there was still a belief in the room that, Hey, if yeah. we just win the next one and then the one after that, like, I, and I think that's a good attitude to have for Elizondo, despite whether or not he believes it, whether he thinks they have a chance in the playoffs, but I mean, he's saying all the right things. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think their chances of the playoffs are something like one or 2%. Um, it, it's not big, but you know how it works in sports. You know how it works in the game of football is, conceding the season when you even have a minuscule chance of making the playoffs, no one is going to concede the season. So, you know, yeah, Jamie Elizondo said we have five targets and we got to hit each target. Now it's a lot of math and a lot of calculators that, uh, that are coming out. And, and, you know, there's an old line that says if you have to rely on mathematics to make the playoffs, that probably is a reflection of how good of a football team you are. Um, Yeah. But you know what? I think with five games left, They've lost five straight. They're two and seven. They also haven't won at home, which is which is crazy, because yeah. um, Commonwealth usually is a very tough place to play for the visiting team. But they haven't won at home this year. So, but you have to find a way to get your your team engaged. Now, I think this week was kind of easy because they had a bye week last week, so everyone comes back and there's kind of a renewed enthusiasm, and which is good to see because you know there's you worry about are there going to be fractures in the and divisions in the locker room and they've actually been quite energetic and loose this week. So uh, that's been good to see. But if you're Jamie Elizondo, you know, until you have the, uh, whatever the symbol is to say that you're out of the playoffs, you still have a shot at it, even though, you know, I'm sitting here today and I'm going, "Ah, I don't, I don't know. It's it's just a lot has to happen for them to make the playoffs. And I think it's very improbable, but you never know. And, and I think as a head coach, you have to, you have to take any sort of motivation or inspiration and sprinkle that on your football team. Well, I mean, if like you, you have to think for them, the playoffs start now um, yes. today, like Friday, right? And and it it would take Hamilton falling to third and them to get the crossover, right? I mean, that's the situation they're kind of looking at. So it's it's really like playoff game one for them on Friday, and I I fully expect them to come out, and I expect the Ticats to be ready. Uh, Dave, uh, really great to connect with you. I feel like I'm uh, a little more set for Friday than I was uh, before <laughs> our chat. So thank you, thank you for doing this. Appreciate it. Happy to help, Louie. Thank you. All right. This has been Speaking with the Enemy. Make sure to check us out uh, when we go live on Friday for the game. It's an 845 free game. Uh, this is for the Tiger Audio Network. I'm Louie B. Have a great day. Speaking with the Enemy. Dropping twice weekly before every Ticats game. Like and subscribe to get inside the enemy's head.